open our Bibles just in the book of Luke's Gospel in chapter 2, the second chapter of the book of Luke's Gospel. We'll just read a few verses from verse number 16, which was read just a few moments ago. That is Luke's Gospel, chapter 2 and verse 16, and we'll just read down to verse number 20. Let's follow the reading of God's infallible word, please. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Eternal God and gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy precious word this evening. And we pray that Thou will bless us in the closing meeting, moments of this meeting. We pray that our God, that You'll speak to each and every one of our hearts. We thank Thee for the truth of the uh, hymn that requires just been singing, to save and to rescue a sinner like me. And, O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for that amazing grace that brought the Savior from above and brought him down to a sin cursing of time and walk amongst men and live that sinless life and then die that atoning death that we might, that we might be redeemed. And, O oh God, I pray that by thy Holy Spirit that thou will bless us as we meet together and write thy word upon each and every one of our hearts. For we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Of course, we remember that the greatest birth in the history of man was the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. Now, every birthday is a marvelous thing. And indeed, whenever we think and we look upon the face of a little child that is born, we can say with the words of the psalmist, we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. But there has never been a miraculous birth like the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, there can be some births that surprise. For example, just one year ago today, uh, my, uh, our Anne and I, would God give us that 11th grandchild? And of course, this is his birthday. And uh, we were with uh, Stephen and Cherie last evening, and little Jacob. And of course, we never forget that birthday because we think of the little surprise after the 10 years in between. And then a little boy comes along. But you know, there never has been a birthday celebrated like the Lord Jesus Christ. Because whenever you think about it, here we have one that has been celebrated for so long and yet so faithfully right to this very Sabbath evening in the house of the Lord. Now, of course, we remember the birth of Christ and Christmas is a wonderful time uh, for to remember uh, and together as a family. It's a, a time of family gatherings whenever people come home and, and people gather together and you have the delicious meals and, and, and that Christmas uh, meal together. It's a time of giving. It's a time of receiving. And yet it is also true that Christmas for some people is a very lonely time because there are those this year that are celebrating Christmas, but they remember that there's a seat that's empty this year that wasn't empty last year. And whenever they think about the loved one that once uh, was with them until this past year and now they've been taken from them, for them it's a time of loneliness, it's a time of sorrow. For other people, it is a time, of course, whenever they just overindulge and it's a time of overspending on gifts as well. But friend, I want us to think about the birth, what this season really means, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I read it, uh, and it was said, if, if man's greatest need had been information, then God would have sent him an educator. If the greatest need of man had been technology, then God would have sent a scientist. If man's greatest need had been money, then God would have sent an economist. If man's greatest need had been pleasure, then God would have sent an entertainer. If man's greatest need had been justice, then God would have sent a judge. But man's greatest need was a Savior. And that's why that God so loved you and me 
that God sent His only begotten Son into this world and to live among men and walk that sinless life in this world and then one day would go to the cross of Calvary and He would shed His precious blood. But I want us to start at the beginning of that story in this earth. I want us to come to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. And whilst we think about the Savior, I want to tell you about three categories of people that were living at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, all recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. I want you to look with me at verse number 1. It says this, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And here's the first category of people that was represented by this man called Caesar Augustus. And whenever I speak about him, I speak about a people that were ignorant. Now, I'm not talking about people who are abusive and being ignorant in that way. But I'm talking about people who are ignorant of the knowledge and of the reality of what was happening at that very time. And Caesar Augustus represents the ignorant. Now, Caesar Augustus was the grandnephew of Julius Caesar. And indeed, Julius Caesar was the, the, the Roman emperor. And Augustus, of course, was not his name. Actually, it was his title. It was a part of his title. It was given to him by the Roman sen Senate because they were giving it to him as a tribute, Augustus. They were giving it to him as a tribute to his greatness because Augustus, or August means exalted, something with great majestic dignity and grandeur. And of course, that would suit Augustus, wouldn't it? You know, we have two months in our calendar, July. Now, where do we get the month of July from? Well, it comes from Julius Caesar. Julius, July. Where do we get August from? Well, August comes from Augustus. The one that's mentioned here in this passage of God's Word. So remember this, those two names, July and August, comes from those rulers of the Roman Empire. And you know, Caesar Augustus was a proud man. He was an arrogant man. He just loved that he got this, uh, this title bestowed upon him. In actual fact, he saw himself as a god. It is said that every Roman citizen was required to offer a pinch of incense upon a burning altar to worship him once per year. That's how proud he was. He wanted people to bow down and to, to really worship him. And the Bible says it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. He made a decree. Why? Because he had this power. He was the most powerful man of earth, and yet he represented the ignorant. The ignorant person. And I'll explain why. You see the word tax there, that all the world should be taxed. Actually, it means to properly to register or enter into a list. In other words, to make a public record, to make a census. This was a census. Now, of course, the purpose of the census was to levy a tax. And so, therefore, the, the first thing he had to do was this. He had to have his census. He had to have his record of all the people in his land or in the world that belonged to him. And so, therefore, he wanted to be sure that nobody missed. Of course, the tax man doesn't want to miss anybody. Neither did Julius Caesar. He wanted to ensure that every person would be upon that census so that, therefore, it would be taxed. But do you notice what the Word of God says there in verse 1? It came to pass in those days. It came to pass in those days. Friend, what came to pass? Well, I'll tell you. If you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, whenever man had sinned, 
And man has sinned against a holy God, and we find there that God makes a promise. He gives a promise, a prophecy. It says in verse number 15 of Genesis chapter 3, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And there was the promise of the coming Savior, the Messiah who was to come, the Deliverer who was to come the Savior of the world. And so God had made a promise. And of course, what came to pass was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to the people of the world and, and, and made to, uh, to Adam and Eve way back there in that Garden of Eden. But friend, let me tell you, God also promised something else. In the book of Micah and the chapter number 5, God promised and God prophesied that it would be in a certain place that this Messiah would come. And it says there in, 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 in Micah chapter 5, in verse number 2, Thou Bethlehem, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler of Israel, whose going forth has been from of old, from everlasting. Here's the promised one. Here is the prophecy that this promised one would come to Bethlehem. Now here's something that happened. Joseph and Mary weren't in Bethlehem. They were in a place called Nazareth. They were down in Galilee. They weren't at Bethlehem at all. And yet the prophecy was that this one that was come, this mighty deliverer who was prophesied and promised, the fulfillment would have to be that it would be in Bethlehem. So how was, how was this to happen? Well, verse 1, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus makes a decree that all the world should be taxed. Let me tell you, my friend, it didn't happen a year before. It didn't happen a year afterwards. Listen, in the fullness of the time when God was going to send forth his Son as our Savior and our Redeemer, listen, here is a cruel, arrogant ruler. You know what happens? God moves in his heart. God works on this ungodly man's heart to make a mighty decree that there was going to be a census. And they had to go back where they came from. Let me tell you, Mary and Joseph couldn't stay in Nazareth. No, they had to go back where they came from. Where was that? Bethlehem. And so we find that God moved the most powerful earthly ruler on the face of the earth, friend, just at that time, to make us decree. And here's where Caesar represents the ignorant, friend. He did not know when he was making that ruling. He did not know when he was making that decree, friend, that this was in the fulfillment of the Word of God and the fulfillment of the prophecy that God had made. Away back in the book of Genesis, away back in the book of Micah, 700 years before it happened. And then 700 years pass after the prophecy. And God works upon a sinful heart. And he makes us decree. You see, friend, what he didn't know that day, mighty Caesar Augustus, he didn't know that God was using his decree to accomplish God's will. And let me tell you, friend, tonight, that ought to encourage the people of God tonight, that we worship a sovereign God. We worship a God, let me tell you, my friend, man sits upon the throne of this world, but I'll tell you this, God overrules even the greatest authority in this world. The Putins of this world, let me tell you, they might think they, they strike fear into the hearts of the people of the world, friend. 
And the Assad's of this world may, may strike fear into the hearts of the people of Syria. And ISIS may, may, may strike fear into the hearts of the world and people don't know what to do. And they say, well, what is happening, preacher? Everything seems to be lost and everything seems to have gone astray. Let me tell you, friend, I'll tell you what's happening. This book's been fulfilled. God's Word has been fulfilled this very night. And all these authorities of the world that think that they're in control, friend, what they're simply doing is this. God's moving them around the stage because God sovereignly is setting the stage for something to happen, the coming again of Jesus. For God not only sent His Son once, God is sending His Son the second time, and the Lord Jesus Christ shall come again. And let me tell you this, same Jesus, that's what the angel said as the disciples looked up into heaven as the Savior was being taken up. They said, this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you've seen Him go. And then it'll happen in according to God's calendar, not man's. You know, sometimes whenever we look at what's happening in the world tonight, sometimes you have got this idea, you know, that, 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 that something's going wrong. Let me tell you, God's working out His plan and God's working out His purpose because the real power behind the decree was not Caesar Augustus. He was the mouthpiece. But the real power behind the decree was God. Child of God, let me encourage you tonight. God's still on the throne. Let me say something to you, child of God, tonight. Listen. The Word of God says all things work together for good. Not some, not most. He says all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. And God was working, let me tell you, away back from that chapter 3 in the book of Genesis. You see, all of those years, friend, through those Old Testament times, listen, God was working throughout the course of human history until, listen, until the perfect time had come in the fullness of the time. At the right moment, at the exact time. There's no accident here. There's no coincidence here. God's here. God's here. And that ought to thrill your, your heart tonight. And the stage of human history continues to be set. Just on that verse 1, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. He's the two. But the tree, decree was God's friend. Why? Because thou Bethlehem, out of thee shall come a ruler. Out of thee. And friend, let me tell you this. God moved away back all of those years ago. And the mighty Caesar Augusta was totally ignorant of it. He didn't see it. He couldn't see it. And as I said... There are many people tonight and they're totally ignorant as to why the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. Let me tell you, my friend, he didn't come for the tinsel of the trees. He came to die in a tree. Not to put the bobble on. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he left the glories of heaven and stepped down into the sin cursed seat of time, friend. And he came with a purpose. And he came at the exact time. Hallelujah. He came at the exact time. And Caesar Augustus made his decree under God. And tonight, The authorities of the world are making their decree, friends. Let me tell you, they'll only be able to go as far as God permits them. 
And when God says so far, no further, they'll find out God's the one in, in control. You see, there's the ignorant. And maybe there's someone here tonight, friend, and listen, I'm not insulting you at all, but I'm saying this. It is very possible that there's someone sitting in this service tonight, and as far as Christmas is concerned, friend, all it is is celebrations, it's parties, it's big dinners, it's, it, 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 it's gifts and all the rest of it, and you have not appreciated the fact, listen, God gave his son to Bethlehem as a little baby. The wonders of wonders. Let me tell you, as Mary looked into the face of that child, let me tell you this. Isn't this the wonder? She looked into the face of her Creator as well as her child. For he's God. And yet man couldn't see it. Is it possible that you can't see your need of a Savior tonight? Here you are, after all your years, and somehow you think that you can go on and live your life, friend, and you can die, and that's the end of it, or you're going to face God, and God's going to open the way of heaven, and open the door of heaven, and just let you straight on in. Though you love the sin. You can't see. You're a sinner lost, helpless, hopeless, undone on your way to hell. Caesar Augustus, he represented the ignorant. He couldn't see. Secondly, very quickly, if you go down to verse number four, it says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and the lineage of David. And so it was, verse six, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be livid, delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Here's the second category. The indifferent. It says there was no room. You see... Verse 4 reminds us how Joseph went up from Galilee unto Bethlehem. And notice it says there, and while they were there. Although it was prophesied 700 years earlier, friend, God's word was fulfilled. That child would not be born until they were there. They were there. Sometimes we worry about God's timing, and indeed, at times we get so impatient seeking God to act. And let me tell you something God's never late, He's always in time. But why were they there? They weren't only there, friend, because that the decree was given, they were there in the purpose and plan of God. But there's something happened there. There was no room for them in the inn. Now, the word inn, actually there are two words for inn, because one word in the Bible can mean a hotel, a motel, a place where they, with a host and provisions and, and also apartments. The other's an enclosure, an open courtyard, a place of shelter, safety, rest for those who are travelers. That's actually the word there. The second one. And yet, friend, I want you to notice that even there, nobody was willing. Here was Mary. She was about to give birth to her child. Nobody was willing to give room for Jesus. Nobody was willing to give up their place. You ask the question, why was there no room for Christ? I'll tell you, my friend, because the rooms were already filled. They were already occupied. There was no room for Christ, and, and nobody was willing to, to say, well, listen, well, I'll move out and let Jesus in, or let Mary and Joseph 
and this little baby in. No, no, nobody was willing to do that. To let Jesus in. And friend, tell me this. Why is there no room in your heart tonight for Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because your heart's already filled. It's already occupied. You're occupied with your sin. You're occupying yourself with your pleasures. You've already your life occupied. Listen, it's not that there's nothing there. There is. And the only place was a stable where animals were kept, and that stable was frequently a limestone cave. And in the end of that limestone cave, there was a niche that was cut in the limestone, and there they would put the hay for the animals. And they're shoved into that. It was the only place for the baby Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Where's Christ shoved into in your life? Where is it? Is he the center of your life? Is he the center of your heart? Have you received him as your Lord and your Savior? You see, the inn was already full of others. And the people were totally indifferent. They didn't care where Mary would bring forth her child. They didn't care. Their lives were already filled. And I asked you a question tonight before God. Tell me, what's filling your heart tonight this Christmas? We sing the hymn, Room for Pleasure, Room for Business. But for Christ the Crucified, not a place that he could enter in your heart for which you die. But then there's a little statement there in that verse, number 7. Look at it because there was no room for them in the end. Let me tell you, my friend, see this old world that we're living in. Not only is there no room for Jesus, but there's no room for those who love Jesus. And there was no room for Christ, and there was no room for Mary, and there was no room for Joseph. No, no, there was no room for them. The sad reality is this tonight, that the world has no room for those that love the Savior. And the Bible, the Lord Jesus said, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But before you criticize them, tell me, have you room for Christ? Will the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, friend, will he really be the center of your Christmas? As you sit around the table of your family, as you open your gifts, listen, will you be thinking of the greatest gift of all and the gift of God's Son? Or will all you care about is what I've got this year? The presses. No room for Jesus. The indifferent. And then lastly, as you continue on down that story in verse number 8, it says, There were in the same country abiding in the fields. Yes, the same country as the indifferent. And the same company as the ignorant. Thank God there was the inquiring or the interested. There were shepherds. Now, we haven't time because time's away tonight, but listen, shepherds were regarded as outcasts. 
They were looked upon as filthy. They were looked upon as unkept and many ways vile. They were looked upon as those that were unfit for worship. And yet, wasn't it amazing that that was the one that God gave the good news to? For he gathers the outcasts. You see, my friend, the Word of God says Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He did not come to call the righteous. He couldn't, because there's none righteous. No, not one. But it came to call sinners to repentance. And I think it's very interesting that those who raise the lambs for the temple sacrifice were the first to meet the Lamb of God. Hasn't got a wonderful plan. Because you see, these shepherds, they raised the lambs for the sacrifice that were pointing to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Well, thank God they were interested. Whenever the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, they were, they were sore afraid. They were, they were terrified. But the angel of the Lord said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And then heaven broke out in song. Look at verse 15. It came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them to heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass. They never doubted the word of God. You see, friend, there's something they could have, they could have debated this. They could have argued about this, but they didn't. They could have dismissed this, but they didn't. But what did they do? They believed it. And they had a longing in their heart, let us go and see. Let us now go. We're not going to wait. We're not going to linger. Let us now go even on to Bethlehem. See this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Verse 16, And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. Listen. They told Mary, they told Joseph, all that the angel had told them. And it says in verse 19, Mary kept all these sayings and pondered them in her heart. And then it says this as we finish, verse 20, And the shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. They saw him. And from that night, friend, when they believed, their lives were changed. They came with curiosity. But thank God they left changed. Changed. You let the Lord change you tonight. You let him save you. God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, friend. There's not one of us but are sinners in the sight of God and we need, we need a Savior. You cannot save yourself. You're a sinner. But thank God, God provided a Savior. 
Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save. I close tonight. Is it your Savior? Young person, is it your Savior? Mommy, Daddy, is it your Savior? If he's not, you're just like those in different. No room. I spell. And then one day, you're going to meet him as your judge. I beg you tonight, don't go home on safe. Make this the greatest Christmas. Mommy, Daddy, children, close the family in with Jesus. And no household salvation. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, friends, tonight, if there's someone here and you say, Preacher, I'm not saved, and realize that you read out a long list tonight of people who have been taken away from the scene of time in a moment. They thought they would be here for Christmas, but their seats are empty. Friend, I cannot promise that I'll be here, and neither can I promise you you'll be here on Christmas Day. I may be home for Christmas. At home with the Lord. Tell me what about you? Hell is not home, friend. Thank God heaven is. And the only way there is Jesus. And the cleansing of your sin his blood. Don't leave tonight without Jesus. Come and speak to us. Mr. McKee, myself, will gladly open the word of God and show you how you can receive. May God bring you to himself. Heavenly Father, save the lost. Restore the fall. And bless your people. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Friend, we're not going to sing any more because time's away, but we're going in a moment across the way to have our supper together. But it's more important that you close in with Christ. Far better you have a soul that's saved and ready for the supper of the Lamb and then to rush to get your supper here and be lost. In the Christ of eternity. May God save you. Let's have a blessing with food. Heavenly Father, bless the food to our bodies. Our friendship, fellowship together. In Jesus' name. Amen. May God grant we'll meet you in his will. Christmas Day. In the Lord's eyes.